Tonight is July 8th, 2015. The topic of tonight's sermon is the one behind the curtain. The one behind the curtain. Um, As we were preparing for tonight, I've been thinking about some of the messages that we've had. Um, Very difficult messages in this season. (laughs) Get ready for persecution because here it comes. We must take a stand. Uh, Sunday... uh, on Sunday, Pastor Eric talked on holiness, holiness, hatred, and bigotry. If I got that in the right order, I'm not sure, but uh, the theme of Sunday's message was about holiness. Really what I want to do is encourage you tonight. The Lord has already encouraged us. Do you feel encouraged or not? Yes. I hope you do. After all that, hopefully it's just sinking in what God um, has spoken to you. Um, I love being in church where during a worship service, I see people reaching over and prophesying to each other. If you're not familiar with what prophecy is, it's a direct word from the God of all creation through one of us to another one of us. Amen. You heard several people step forward and give a prophecy on the microphone. You heard a prophecy in tongues from the back of the room. I saw people praying for and prophesying to each other throughout the service, throughout the worship time. That's a good service. Amen. Um, I used to be a little intimidated after a service like that or after worship service like that because I'm like, golly, how am I going to follow that? Right? Uh, I'm getting old enough now, I guess. I'm like, man, that, took, that just takes all the pressure off. It used to, I used to let it add pressure onto me, and now I completely think it alleviates all pressure because God has already spoken. Amen. And the truth is, is um, once we get further and long in the Word, you're going to hear exactly what God has already spoken. Guess what He's going to do because He loves us? He's going to tell us again. Yes. <laughs> There's going to be some of the exact same concepts that you've already heard that are going to come out again and what the Lord has already prepared for us tonight. Amen? Um, If you will turn to Psalms chapter 77, we're going to start here. Good job. Wow. Way to go, Abby. (laughs) Psalms 77. She she beat me there by a lot. I was like, whoa. Psalms 77. Um, As as I was preparing for tonight, I actually, for some reason, uh, thought back to the Wizard of Oz. I don't know if you guys have ever, if, if you remember The Wizard of Oz. I think it was written in uh, 1939 or something is when they did the production that most of us kind of envision in our minds when we see it. It was a book from maybe even the 1800s or something that they redid. And uh, um, there's a lot of things that come to mind, so I'll try not to chase too many rabbits. But uh, one of the main scenes in the movie is the revelation that uh, the wizard, the great Wizard of Oz, he's standing behind this curtain, and Toto, the little dog, kind of goes over there, and he's... Got, he's behind a curtain, and what he's doing is kind of making all these, spinning these dials and pushing these buttons and causing all this pageantry to go on. <laughs> and in the midst of it, he speaks in the loudspeaker and says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, it's because it's you, bro. <laughs> he, he was trying to be the wizard, and we realized, okay, he's not much of a wizard at all. Um, in Psalms chapter 77, this is actually what got me to think about that. I'm sorry that that was the connection that was made in my brain, but it was. And it says this, Psalm 77, verse 19. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Perhaps we should consider tonight that God is leading us in ways that we can't even perceive. That some of the things that are going on, I heard the word that Pastor Eric gave, I tried to jot it down, I don't know that I caught it all, Um, I don't know that my pen was as fast as what my heart was trying to receive. Uh, Persecution is to come to us because God is giving them into our hands. Um, He's going to use you as a tester of metal. (laughs) We're to seek the God of heaven for souls. Those who are offended at our very existence, perhaps those are the very ones that He is giving and delivering to us. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. How many times is God at work in our lives and we just miss the whole fact? We don't see His footprints, so we sometimes miss the fact that He is at work. It is His design. The very oppression and persecution that we see that is going to come upon us is good. It's a good thing for us. It is a good thing for the body of Christ that we are in these days. Just like I feel it an honor that God has chosen me to be here as part of this church, just like when I look at you tonight, I don't worry about performing for you. Because I love you too much to worry about performing for you. 
I love you so deeply that all I want to do is share the word of God with you. That's, all, that's my only job tonight is to wash your feet with the water of the word. <laughs> God has chosen us and he's placed us here because it's a great honor, because he's a good God. The times that he has chosen us to live in, perhaps it's like Acts 17 says, that it is the times and the places that God has appointed for his children to be. So this is exactly what we are. We should relish. Turn to Esther chapter 1. <clears throat> Esther chapter 1. We're basically going to do a survey of Esther tonight. Okay? Survey means we're going to go from a 30,000 foot view. We're going to fly over the entire book of Esther. And hopefully have a few things um, that really encourage our hearts tonight. Esther chapter 1. <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do is do the, do the flyover and not actually hit on the main part of the story that we probably already know. Okay? <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about Esther, and we're going to kind of skim past the parts that we know, and we're going to get on to some other things tonight. Chapter 1. Uh, let's start in verse 5. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. Everybody say seven days. Seven days. <clears throat> now, you guys are going to have to help me out tonight. Literally, my ears are stopped up, and I can't, hopefully I'm not screaming at you. I figure Rick will take care of that. He'll give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. But I, I, I'm having a hard, I literally am having a hard time hearing tonight. So y'all going to have to help me out. And when you, when you say something, I need, I need you to say it back to me. So when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. Seven days. Thank you. The, in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest. Everybody say least to the greatest. Least to the greatest. This is King Xerxes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set this passage up for you. And we're going to take it out of the context for just a second. And just listen to it as if you had never read the book of Esther before. Listen to it as if... This wasn't, you didn't know that this was a king of Persia that was throwing a banquet that lasted for seven days. <clears throat> the enclosed garden in the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest. Verse 6, the garden had hangings of white and blue linen, fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver, on a mosaic pavement of porphyry marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. If you didn't know, what would you think that that would be a description of? Heaven. This is a pretty heavenly example, isn't it? Let's go back and read those same verses. Uh, let's start in from the least to the greatest, right? Everybody was there. Verse 6, the garden had hangings of white. In the Bible, white, you get a lot of purity. You're supposed to think of purity. White and blue linen. Blue is a heavenly color. Fastened with cords of white linen. There it is again. And purple material. Perhaps majesty, royalty. To silver ring. Silver in the Bible represents redemption. On marble pillars. When you think of marble pillars, you think of strength and stability. There were couches of gold. Gold, divinity. And silver. You keep going down all these costly stones. This is painting a pretty opulent picture, isn't it? I mean, this, is, this guy is throwing a parte. He is throwing it out and he's doing it right. He's doing it big and bold. And we know that as it goes through, uh, the king, the very king, summons his wife, Queen Vashti. She decides that she will not come to acknowledge the king. The king talks to all his, uh, his cohort of advisors who are around. And by the way, you've got to read some of these names. I mean, we, we know as a church, if you've been here for very long, uh, let's just look in like verse 10. This is just for fun. This is actually not advancing the point. I just love you and we're family, so I'm going to read it. Right. Me human. <laughs> Bizfa. Harbona. Bigtha. Come on, bro. <laughs> Come on now. Come on, Bigtha. Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. I love the Bible, man. I just thought I'd read that to you. That has really nothing to do with the point. I just like the names. So, so the king starts finding, uh, these were actually the people that were sent uh, when the king was in high spirits to go get Vashti. 
That's what that list is there for. She denies. Let's take a look in Esther chapter 1, verse 19. <clears throat> Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree. This is his version of what he's going to do, how he's going to handle his wife. And let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Perhaps we should be fearful if we decide that when the king calls, we, sh we don't want to answer Perhaps we should think and consider these things. I know these are ungodly people that we're actually talking about, but I find truth <laughs> throughout the word. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Hmm. People who refuse to hear the king's call. There is a replacement idea that goes on here, right? Verse 20. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realms, all the women will respect their husbands, from the least to the greatest. The reason I wanted to read that verse was not because of the obvious women respecting their husbands part. What did it say? Huh, what? <laughs> right? What I wanted to encourage you with this. Um, Esther, when, it was, when, um, when scholars were pulling together what books would be in the Bible, Esther was considered, it was on a, a fence. They were trying to figure out if Esther should be in the Word of God or if it should not be included. Um, it's a great story, right? If you know the story, you've got, you know, an evil, bad guy. You've got a beautiful princess, a queen. You've got, you've got all these things that make for a great story in this, but they were really trying to consider. And one of the things that was tilting in the no category was the fact that it doesn't actually ever mention the word of the Lord in the text. Hmm. So they were trying to consider, but what they found, this is incredible, what they found was that there are four places in the book of Esther that in the original language you can see the name of God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H would be the English versions of these letters, are actually found in the text. <laughs> and in some of the manuscripts, they were highlighted. Have you ever done that? You just, you just bold the first letter of something, you're, you're going along and you see this acronym, whatever it's called, when you highlight the first letter of a word and you realize, they realize that it's spelled out Yahweh. Um, Stephanie, if you'll put up that slide with the Hebrew text on it. Okay, lest you think that I'm making this up for all of you Hebrew scholars. Okay, the top one, the, reason, the, the number over here to the left is the chapter and verse of what you're seeing there. Okay, so what we just read was Chapter 1, verse 20, Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realms, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. So that is the text of what is being said. But if you'll notice, I don't know if you can see where they're highlighted, but they're highlighted second row down. Um, it, there's a little, they're a little bit red. So if you can, hopefully you're not colorblind and you can see those. And what it does is it spells it out backwards for the Hebrew language. This is a, this is a Gentile that's speaking... So it's not written in a Hebrew way, which would be from right to left. The letters of Yahweh are written from left to right. It's a Gentile that's, okay, catch, this is, this is kind of cool. From left to right, which is the way that we read, and the way that we write, it's actually written that direction. In chapter 5, verse 4, let's just look these up real quick. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 4. <clears throat> It says this, If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. 5-4. This is Esther speaking, a Jew, so it is written from right to left. Just the way a Hebrew would speak. Okay? And again, <laughs> yeah, hard to see the highlight there, but I, I hope you guys are seeing this. And if you're not, I, I have a, a page that I can get a copy for, it, for you after. Let's turn to 513. It says this, but all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. This was Haman. It is written from left to right. As the Gentiles are speaking, it's written the way that we would see it. As the Jews are speaking, it's written the way that they would see it and say it and write it. Chapter 7. Verse 7, <clears throat> the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, and that's right exactly where the word Yahweh places right over that part of the text, 
stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. So again, we're talking about Haman, talking about a Gentile, it's left to right. Tucked away in the text, um, if you don't think that God (laughs) is working in an unseen fashion, even when we can't see his footprints, as it says in Psalms, God is at work. He's designed to be working in our lives here. Now, what does all this have to do? I I want to do one more. In chapter 7, verse 5, it says this in English. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such thing? Now, this word is not Yahweh. This last one here, it spells the word that translates into I am that I am. Amen. I'm going to read this again to you and know that this is underneath the text. This is the text. Before you translate it, the words are I am that I am. Who is he? Where is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Um, in the Hebrew, this I am that I am is actually a palindrome. Does everybody know what a palindrome is? A palindrome is a word that's spelled the same forward or backward. Uh, race car. Dad. Mom. Wow. <laughs> Madam, I'm Adam. <laughs> it is, I trust <laughs> Some of you are like, is it? Yes, it is. Madam, I'm Adam is a palindrome. Same forward or backward. When God is saying that I am, that I am, perhaps He doesn't care if we're Jew or Gentile. Perhaps it doesn't matter what direction that we're trying to read this thing from. Perhaps it doesn't even matter if we're the least or the greatest. Perhaps the God who says I am that I am means that He is who He is. Perhaps it's something that He's trying to teach us in saying when we go, God, who is, what is, how I am that I am. I don't care how you read that. It is, I am that I am. That's exactly what he's trying to be in our life. That is exactly who he is. If you are not encouraged by the very... I know, I know this is a, a text. It's an equal letter spacing thing. It's all these different things. If you're not encouraged by the fact that Yahweh God put his name in the middle of the text in this, if you're not encouraged by the fact that he left a palindrome in the middle of this thing to go, hey in case you're really, really studying and you're just a nerd like Wade Sutherland and like all this stuff just geeks you out to the max, no matter how deep you want to study this scripture, it's going to speak truth to your life. No matter how much you want to find from the historical perspective, you know what it's going to do? It's going to bless your life. It's going to be something for us to measure our life by. Go back to chapter 2. Are you all with me so far? Yes. The word is palindrome, boys and girls. Palindrome. Learned a word tonight. That's great. And you use the Hebrew to do it. That's pretty cool. Okay, chapter 2. Um, let's start in verse 7. I'm trying not to read the entire book of Esther to you tonight. So, chapter 2, verse 7 says this Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah. Everybody say Hadassah. Hadassah whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. The girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and feature, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. The word there for Hadassah is a a word that can be translated, and it's the same type of word that comes um, to let us know about a myrtle tree. Myrtle. Um, Pastor Eric has done sermons in the past, and that we've studied on olive and acacia trees, cedar trees, and myrtle trees. Um, Keep your place here in Esther and turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Myrtle trees. Isaiah chapter 55. You know what, when when I was looking at it this afternoon to find out just more information about a myrtle, um, my dad was always one. He could look at a tree and tell me what it was and tell me, you know, all the kind of things about it for, for whatever reason. That did not get handed down in the genes. You know, he could, we could drive through, uh, go through the country, and he'd tell me all the 50 different types of trees, and I'm like, that's great. Uh, they're trees, right? So myrtle tree, some very interesting, one of the, one of the things that I found most interesting about myrtle um, was this, was that it, it's such a fragrant tree. <laughs> it's almost like Esther was designed 
was created to be a fragrant offering unto the Lord. It's almost like her life was something that was supposed to be. We know that she goes through lots of treatments in chapter 2 before she's presented to the king. (laughs) It's echoing the very core of who she is in this passage. Isaiah 55 and verse 10 says this, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, So is my word that comes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Um, We're going to keep going here in this passage in just a second, but let me encourage you. Guys, as we live our lives by the word of God, I had a limited understanding of this scripture growing up. I thought that meant if you use the word of God that everything would work out always in a positive manner. What it actually says is that the Word of God is going to do exactly what it was supposed to do in that situation. That's right. The reason I'm bringing this up is as uh, one of the words that came forth tonight was that we are supposed to pray for souls. We are supposed to pray for the lost that God would give them to us. Did y'all hear that word? Yes? yes? yes. I heard it. Just want to make sure that, that we're hearing the same thing. That not only are we supposed to circumcise our hearts, but we're supposed to pray for the lost. Let me encourage you, when you speak with someone... That offense that Pastor Eric spoke about when he gave that prophecy tonight, the offense being the sign that they were supposed to be handed into our hands at that moment. Don't get upset if you bring someone the Word of God and they get offended at you. The Word here is saying that it will accomplish what it's set out to do. And you know what it's going to do sometimes? Sometimes it's going to harden people's heart. Sometimes they're going to hear the Word of God and go, you know what? I hear what you're saying and I choose not to follow that. That is not the version of me speaking to someone that I like to... I don't enjoy that kind of conversation. I don't like that. I don't hope that or wish that for them. But you know what I trust? I trust that when the Word of God goes forth, it will accomplish what it's supposed to do. (laughs) What's, What's the old saying? The same sun that hardens wax, that hardens clay, melts wax. Sorry, said that very poorly. The same sun that hardens clay, melts wax. (laughs) If your heart is soft before the Lord, when He shines upon you, you melt in His presence. The sin that you thought you wanted to hold on to, which God repeatedly did tonight, He said, you need to cut that out. Why? Because He's shining His light on you, and we'll see if you're actually made of clay, or if you're actually made of wax, something that will just melt in His presence, and can be reshaped the way that He desires. Amen? Amen? Verse 12, you will go out in joy... Everybody say joy. Joy. Be led forth in peace. Everybody say peace. Peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Verse 13, instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree. And instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. (laughs) I'm reminded elsewhere in Isaiah, he'll give us what? Beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This is the exchange that God wants to to give us. We can live in our own way. We can try to do things. We can miss the fact that He is at work even though His footsteps are unseen. Or we can understand that in place of our briars, He'll give us a myrtle. He'll give us something fragrant and beautiful. Back to chapter 2 of Esther. (laughs) The myrtle was also used. I'll just reference this and you can look it up later in in Nehemiah chapter 8. Myrtle branches were some of the ones that were used to build the booths for the field of tabernacles. Beautiful, beautiful picture. We've talked a lot about um, the Feast of Tabernacles on Monday nights and and even this past Sunday. Back to Esther chapter (laughs) 2. Since I just defined Hadassah for you as myrtle, it also means joy. It also references to a bride, right? Um, Haman. Haman is an interesting word. Haman is an... Agagite. Most Bible scholars believe that, that say that he is an Amalekite. Amalekite, right? Uh, Amalekites were warlike valley dwellers. Warlike valley dwellers. Chew on that one for a minute. <laughs> the one who's going to oppose God's people, we know the story. I'm not, not surprising anyone. No spoiler alerts needed because you already know the story. The one who is opposing God's people is a warlike valley dweller. 
What does that mean? It means he's going to stay in the lowest places he can to try to catch you at your lowest place. This is the warlike guy, Haman, that has been sent out and his whole purpose in this story, as you know, is to destroy God's people. And we're going we're to look into this even more here in just a second. Uh, chapter 2, let's look at verse 15. <clears throat> when, the, when the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Higiah, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. Love this next sentence. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. Huh. Something different about this one. She was taking taking the king Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Turn to chapter 3 and verse 5. This is where Haman, we see that he is a warlike valley dweller. Chapter 3, verse 5 says this, When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Do not be surprised when we stand up for holiness, whether it's about same-sex marriages, whether it's about the holiness that the Bible speaks of, beyond just the same-sex marriages. Don't be surprised when we stand up and people are enraged with us. They are enraged. Yet having learned, verse 6, yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, Haman scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Wouldn't that make sense? Haman has been exalted to a place of leadership in this Persian kingdom. He's standing there. Mordecai does not bow a knee. Doesn't even pretend. Doesn't even curtsy. Just says, no, I'm not going to do that. Just not going to happen. You would think that the guy who has the power would just kill Mordecai. He would just take care of the issue. He was so incensed, he was so enraged, that look what it says. He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. (laughs) You think he was a little mad? He turned in... He turned into Hitler because the guy didn't bow down. Are, are, you, are you understanding the gravity of the situation? He literally wanted to kill everybody. <laughs> kill you and your brothers and your sisters and your aunts. Everybody. I want to take them all out because this guy would not bow his knee. Do you think that's demonically <laughs> encouraged or not? When people respond to you in some way that seems so ridiculously over the top, perhaps you come across a spiritual battle here that is from a valley dweller against the people of God. Perhaps that when they really, really respond to you, and you're like, God, I was so taken back because it was such violent response. Yep, this is the way that it happens, folks. There are valley dwellers who are going to oppose what God's people are doing here. <laughs> Persecution is to come to us. Because God is giving them into your hands. Those are the words that I tried to script down tonight from the prophecy. He's going to use us as a tester of metals. Those who have the greatest offense at your very existence is a sign that He is giving them into your hands. That's the words from tonight. Praise be to God who speaks to us. Praise be to God who understands and is speaking through his word that was written. Uh, This book took place about 480 B.C. Give or take a few years, about 475, 480 B.C. Um, And it echoes things that had gone on before. And we are 2,500 years past that, whatever it is. And it's still speaking to us. (laughs) It's still calling out to us. Turn um, chapter 3, verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, everybody say first month. First month. The royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script. This is the explanation of the decree that Haman, the valley dweller, the one with the spirit of Hitler upon him, comes and writes to actually enact. He didn't just have an anger in him that was so great that it had to be described like that. He actually had authority to carry it out. This is him starting to perform that. 
Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews. Now, if you'll just take just a, a break with me for a second. <laughs> it would have been enough had they just said to destroy all the Jews. Perhaps we will kill all the Jews or annihilate them. The fact that we say all three words here just makes me laugh. In order to destroy, kill, and annihilate them. It was an old movie. It was like, first we stab them, then we shoot them, then we kill them. You know, that's, I actually think of this progression that kind of goes on where you're like, we're going to destroy them and kill them and annihilate them. All right, big guy, I think we, think we got your point. We are, we are clear now on your decree that this is bad news for the Jews. I'm sorry that my brain actually works that way, but it does. Um, young and old women and little children, on a single day. Now listen to this. The 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So this was the 13th day of the first month, first month of the year. The attack will happen on the 13th day of the last month of the year. I wonder why. I wonder if even in Haman's hatred of what's going on, his just enraged that he is, this demonic influence that must have come upon him to hate something and someone so bad for not dealing, kneeling down, total pride issue. Perhaps what he thought was going to be his greatest day of vindication, perhaps in the very way that it was established, God was allowing room for him to do something mighty in the middle. Perhaps when we're looking at things and like, geez, this is... I can't, I don't understand why this is this way. Oh, that's just not nice. I mean, we're just going to have to lament and worry about things for a long time, aren't we? I just see a lot of time for God to do a whole lot of things in between. I'm not going to lament and worry about a day down here if I know that I'm walking with the God of all creation. I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm I'm just not. I'm not going to worry if if our government takes away a tax-exempt status. I'm just not going to worry about it. (laughs) Is there persecution coming? Yeah, probably and you know what? I know that my God is going to be with me. Amen. I'm not worried. I don't worry about tomorrow. Amen. You know why? Because he's with me. If I'm worried about tomorrow, it shows that I have, that there's, I have a lack in my own heart of understanding who he really is and seeing that perhaps he's working even when I can't see his footsteps. I trust that he's working. I know that he is. Take a look at chapter 4. <clears throat> chapter 4 is when Before you get to chapter 4, I'm sorry. I wanted to read one more verse. I could do so many, but chapter 3, verse 15 says this. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Everybody heard that this was coming, and I have no particular um, spiritual, or scriptural grounds for this, but I, I would imagine that it's because they knew Jews. And they were like... Why would you, really, you want to kill all, ooh, wow, wow, what is, what is all that about? The people of the city were bewildered. In chapter 4, we see <laughs> Mordecai learns about this. He puts on sackcloth and ashes. It's amazing. Before God moves, he always wants his people to repent, yeah. to cleanse themselves, to get rid of the silt and the sand and the garbage that can divert the river of his presence in your life. Perhaps it's the very things that he's told us tonight is exactly what's predicated on him moving powerfully in our lives. Huh. Interesting. Chapter 4, verse 12. So back and forth. Mordecai is outside of the, of the gates. Queen Esther's in the palace. They send a runner. Back and forth. They have a conversation, but it's taking place through one person who's running back and forth. Verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, He sent back this answer. Do you think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Let me encourage you, folks. The reason we're trying to encourage everyone in here to stand strong, you know why? Because God's will is going to be accomplished. 
We want you to be a part of it. Amen. We, we, we desire, we weep, we pray for us as a church to be every one of us, that there not be one that we lose, that everyone stands strong because you know what? His will is going to get accomplished. I just want to put myself in the place where he can use me. We want to, as a church, put ourselves in a place where God can use us to be that salvation. For if, the, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your family, uh, you and your father's family will perish. And this question that becomes a very popular question, and who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this? Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps you're exactly where you are. You're in this church for such a time as this. Perhaps this is exactly what you need. Perhaps this is exactly what God had intended for you. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When all this is done, I will go to the king. Even though it is against the law. Hmm. There's some things higher than the law of the land, right? And if I perish, I perish. This first time that she's going to go in before the king, there is... Please fast and pray. I'm going to fast and pray. There's a lot of angst that's going on, but she's already decided in her heart. If I perish, then I perish. Chapter 5, verse 1. On the third day, everybody say third day. Third day. Hmm. Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace. I'm reminded of the passage, I think it's in Matthew 22, where the king who made a wedding banquet invited certain people to come. They didn't want to come. They said, go anywhere you want. Find them in the highways and the byways and bring them. And there was a particular man walking around who just decided he was going to try to show up in the same old filthy garments that he was going around in. When we're going before the king, we should put on... (laughs) I know our culture is very relaxed. I'm in jeans and a short sleeve shirt, right? I know many people decided they wanted to dress a certain way but their hearts might as well be in in tattered rags before the king. (laughs) I'd rather be in jeans here and have my heart with my royal robes on before I go into his presence. I'm going to get cleaned up. I'm going to put on my Sunday best from a generation before, right? That's what we always, we had our Sunday best. And we knew, we knew what my mom meant when she said Sunday best. It was like an outfit, (laughs) you know, we kind of saved it. Well, there's, there's a presence here on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. May we all know exactly what it's like to look at our king and him see us and feel pleasure and favor upon us and stretch out his royal scepter towards us and say, ah, oh, that's my child. Oh, that's, that's my beloved. That is, that is my queen. That is that he saw and said, yeah, oh, I'm so pleased. Please come into my presence. Please come into my presence. You are welcome here. So Esther approached and touched the tip of his scepter. The king asked, who is it? Uh, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. Incredible. (laughs) Anything you want, baby. What you want. I got you. Anything you want, up to half the kingdom. Because if you go over half, then I don't have half. You know, right? But (laughs) I digress. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Uh, If you remember on our Hebrew list, that was one of the passages that Yahweh reminds us that he's in the story. He's he's underlying these motions. He is showing us that what he is and who he is. Um, When we were singing, um, Pastor Matt kind of focused on one of the songs and just focused on I am yours. Just stayed on it for a couple of minutes. I am yours. I am yours. 
I am yours. All I have, I am yours. And it brought my mind and my heart to this where Esther's before the king. <laughs> she touches his royal scepter. She's there saying, hey, Lord, I want to be yours. I'm fully, fully committed to this. Uh, turn to chapter 7. Chapter 7, and starting in verse 3. So she holds a banquet for the king and Haman. Haman thinks, once again, uh, he is completely honored. His arrogance plays into his downfall yet again. Come, come for day one of the banquet. Okay, what is it that you want, Esther? Well, if, if it may please the king, can we do this again tomorrow? Okay. They come, and here is, here is the point in chapter 7, verse 3. Then, the queen, then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. <laughs> my petition is for my life, and my request is for my people. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I, wouldn't, I would have kept quiet. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Verse 5, King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? This is where we remember in our scripture that it said, I am that I am. Right? Is the underlying. Who is he? Where is this man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is this vile Haman. This vile valley dweller is coming against us. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. I'm sure he was. It's not, it's not like it's a huge banquet with hundreds of people. It's the king and the queen and Haman. And I'm sure attendants standing around ready to serve them. The king got up in a rage. I'm sure he did. Left his wine and went out into the palace gardens. But Haman realized, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. I hope that you guys are just picturing some of this. She's, on, she's just kind of... This has happened. She's reclining on a couch. He's falling on the couch to try to beg for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall. Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in my own house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Your face. And then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. The very devices that the enemy wants to use to destroy us will be his own destruction. The very things, the very persecution that's designed to kill the church will only cause it to thrive. Chapter 8, verse 1. Then the same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman. <laughs> oh my goodness! This is a great story! The, the same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Huh. Our prosperity, I, I can't even call it prosperity gospel, because it's not the gospel. But the prosperity teachings that our country and, and others around the world are so fond of, <laughs> there is a truth here that the prosperity of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. That it, that it is. God has all of this. And there's going to be such amazing blessing that come. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told him how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. I wonder how he reclaimed it, by the way. I wonder if it was after Haman's face had been covered, or, you know, just, just a thought. <laughs> and Esther appointed Mordecai over Haman's estate. Do you, do you just love this or not? This, this story is incredible. We would call it ironic from a humanistic point of view. It's ironic that now Mordecai is literally the one in charge of all of Haman's belongings. Huh. 
Maybe it's just kind of the way that God thinks. Turn to the end of chapter 8. Verse 15, Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, and a purple robe of fine linen. Does that remind you of anything that we read tonight? Perhaps in chapter 1, right? Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments. (laughs) God's people covered in royal garments of blue and white, heavenly, pure, large crown of gold, a purple robe of fine linen, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict of the king went out, there was joy and gladness among the Jews. So the edict that went out from Haman, with the king's stamp on it, 13th day of the first month, This is 70 days later, 70, on the 23rd day of the third month. 70, 70. We know that God takes the 12 springs to feed the 70 palms. We know that God's people are designed to literally reach the world. Right? If you need further explanation to that, come on Monday nights. And you can learn all about that. Verse 17, In every province and in every city wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Now hold up. Wait a minute. Um... The 13th day of the 12th month is still coming. But the edict of the king now says, you know what, you people can stand up and defend yourselves. You can go ahead and stand up and defend yourselves because the day is going to come. That didn't actually change in the story. If this was an Americanized story, that day would have been done away with. There would have been no actual trouble and battle to come. It would have just been alleviated. Perhaps we would have all floated away somewhere. But in the Scripture... The day was still there. And yet God had said, ah, He'd made a provision through that day. Many people of other nationalities became Jews. That which was meant to be the end of mortality became the beginning of multiplication for the people of God. (laughs) We're going to try to kill you. I mean, destroy you. I mean, annihilate you. Oh, yeah, right. And what it's going to do is just going to multiply us. You persecute the real people of God and they multiply. Amen. Hmm. Amen. We talk a lot about it in our church. We understand that prophecy, um, we're, we're meant to see the repeating patterns throughout the Scripture. We're meant to see those things that happen over and over and over again. And sometimes prophecy, more than only trying to predict the future, we can see that, that God was at work even though His footprints were unseen to us throughout the course of time. I welcome the persecution not because I'm some masochistic, I like pain kind of person, but because I know that it actually produces revival in the house of God. Yes. I know that it actually multiplies when we can die to ourselves and be renewed in Him. Chapter 9, we're, almost, we're, we're, getting, we're getting close. Chapter 9, oh, there's so many good things. Um, start in verse 20. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews. So after all this had been done, (laughs) in many of the outlying areas on the 13th day of the 12th month, the battle came and the Israelites, the Jews, they routed the enemy. Hmm. Routed them. Annihilated them. Destroyed them. Hmm. Some of the same words that were used against them is what happened in their favor. So, and actually, so much so in the city, uh, uh, in Susa, the queen went back to the king and she said, oh, great king, can we have one more day? Can we extend this battle till tomorrow? Because we're not quite done yet. And in Susa, he said, oh, sure, have another day. You can have the 13th and the 14th. (laughs) Great, because we just got some more, we got some more booties to kick. 
I'm sorry, we're just not done yet. The king actually granted it another day there. That's why, um, let's go to verse 18. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th day, and then on the 15th day they rested and made a day of feasting and joy. So some people were feasting and joyful on the 14th, some on the 15th, just because they had more enemies to put down. All right? Sounds like fun. This is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observed the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Verse 20, Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. Right? We're just going to make them both days. We'll celebrate both days in the future. As the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy. Amen. Huh. Their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe these days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. This is not a sacred holiday. It wasn't something instituted by the Lord. It was instituted right here out of the book of Esther. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun doing what Mordecai had written to them for Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agite, Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head. Huh, that reminds me. Proverbs, really quickly, hold your place there. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33. Proverbs sixteen thirty-three says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Amen. Huh. This is the feast of Purim, the lot that was cast against them, but every decision was from the Lord. Amen? Back to Esther. Um, back on his head, and, and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows, verse 26. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word pure. Because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom. Um, and then in chapter 10, as we wrap it up, just listen to these three verses. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to his distant shores and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai. It's King Xerxes writing this to which the king had raised him. Are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? In their history books was written about the greatness of Mordecai. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes. Who have we been studying? <coughs> Maybe on Monday nights as we're going through the book of Genesis, we see an initiation of a pattern that is here again, once again repeated through Mordecai. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he had worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. Amen. Wow. <laughs> we talked, <laughs> the title of this one was The One Behind the Curtain. That perhaps God is at work even when his footprint is unseen in your life. <laughs> the most obvious Part of that, the one behind the curtain, as, as I was thinking through it, was just that um, he is the one behind the curtain. There was another curtain that the Word clearly tells us about that led into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And that veil, that was rent from top to bottom so that now we can see, we can enter in. We can actually go to where his presence is. He has extended the golden scepter to us and that we can come into His presence. I just want to encourage you guys tonight. I, I think the Word of God was so strong during our, our worship. If you don't get anything else, one, I hope that you take more time and go back over the book of Esther. Ten chapters, about 167 verses in it. Mentions the kingdom about 30 times. The kingdom. There are underlying principles that are thread through that. I hope you take time to enjoy that. 
hope you consider that God is at work in your life even when you don't see Him. I hope you don't bring an accusation against the Lord of all hosts because you're not quite sure and you can't see the footprints. You don't know that Yahweh is ingraining His presence underneath the surface in your life. You, you haven't quite figured out that He is the I am that I am, that He has designed this for all peoples, that His power is at work even though the valley dwellers come against you, that He is working because He is good He is a powerful God that will work this. Even though the day of destruction may still be on the calendar, He will give you an overcoming power to get through that day. 